The following program is made possible in part by a generous grant from the Educational Foundation of America. City University Television. In association with the Center for Advanced Study in Theater Arts. And the Harold Clerman Endowment. Presents Spotlight. Welcome to the Harold Clerman Seminar on Theater. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest is one of the foremost directors, writers, producers in the theater we've ever known, Mr. George Abbott. George, welcome. Thank you for being here very much. Thank you. George, you, your career spans all the time from 1913, when you first acted on Broadway, uh, straight through to the present, when you're still going strong uh, at, at this moment. And, of course, in the 20s and 30s, you directed a lot of melodramas and farces. Then you began directing musicals with Rodgers and Hart. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the period after World War II, uh, and particularly plays like uh, Damn Yankees and Pajama Games, which you both were a co-writer on and the director of. Uh, what, how, to, how did those two ventures start, and how did they come about? Then... Yankees came about because a man sent me a book that he wanted, thought might make a, a play, and I grabbed it immediately. Really? Uh, and uh, the, the year the Yankees lost, the, lost pennant. the pennant, I think was the name of the book. And, uh, but Pajama Game was something Hal, Prince, and Bobby Griffith got this idea of doing a musical out of a novel about a pajama game. I said, well, that's not, we're not musical material. And I don't know by what process they gradually broke me down and I agreed to make an adaptation of it. And so the author and I worked on a musical. And, uh, of course, it became an enormous hit, and it's done... Uh, it still is. <laughs> still done. Well, it was, it was revived not uh, too long ago at the New York City Opera, uh, which is an interesting uh, place for it to be. But I guess it's done all over the country, probably all over the world, really, Pajama Game. And Damn Yankees. I, I remember seeing a Damn Yankees tryout in New Haven, Connecticut. Yes. And I think I saw one of the first previews. And uh, there's, because I, this leads to something about your directing and the way you worked, as I recall, uh, the song You've Got to Have Heart uh, surprised everybody with how popular it was. And uh, so you all uh, added it. I guess you brought it into the, into the play uh, as a reprise or something later on. Oh, well, uh, You've Got to Have Heart was written after, uh, after the show had been started rehearsal to fill a certain spot. Oh, really? It yes. wasn't considered, it wasn't thought that it would be a big number? Well, we liked it. But I remember I was in the audience one of the first times it was, I think, performed for an audience, and the audience just uh, uh, really was uh, tremendously enthusiastic about it. And uh, so obviously you turned something that was just a filler situation into uh, something mm -hmm. much bigger. You had, was Gwen Verdon, was she, in, was she in Damn Yankees, as I recall? Gwen, was she, she was, she was Damn it. is that the first time you had worked with her, was, uh, was, yes. was on that show? Mm -hmm. Was she uh, a good person to work with? Wonderful. She's a good actress as well as a good dancer. And that makes a difference, I No, think. she's very, uh, very... Uh, Present to work with. You've worked with a lot of important people in the theater, a lot of stars, people like Ethel Merman. What was Ethel what, in Call Me Madam? Didn't you direct her in Call yes. Me Madam? What was she like to work with? She was good, uh, very uh, agreeable to changes. Really? Not temperamental, in other words. No. I think that actress and actresses know <coughs> that I, having been an actor, will make them better. 
And so they are agreeable to my suggestions. So, in other words, they trust you when you ask them to yes. try. Do you do a lot when you are directing of trying it one way to see if it works and then changing it to something else? Or? Well, I do a lot uh, often of putting in a line and, and they do it and then I either cut it out or add it into it. Or, I mean, after I hear them say it, I make some decision. And would the same thing be true for some business, for some action on stage? Oh, yes. That you try and then it might not work. Oh, time and again you say you cross over and hit him. And, <laughs> and then you say, no, don't. He crosses over to you. Well, you find, now, you, you first directed the show Broadway in 1926, I think. And then you did a, uh, a version of it just a few years ago. Uh, at the occasion when there was a celebration for your 100th birthday, I recall. That's and right. And I saw that production. You made some changes then. You're always still changing things. Oh, did I make changes? You told, you told me at the time that you made some changes. A few, rewrote a few of the jokes that you thought maybe were either had dated somewhat or uh, things had Well, changed. of course, uh, as you know, everybody considered it dated. <laughs> 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 so I haven't been conscious but, of how... Uh, much, in a way, it had been imitated. But now, do you, when you're going to do a play over again, like uh, Broadway, or like you did a revival of On Your Toes on Broadway a few years ago and in London, do you start from scratch when you are directing it, or do you try to remember what you'd oh, done? Oh, no, I can't remember. You can't? No. Is that, so you start all over again? I have a very lousy memory. <laughs> so you start all over again? Oh, yes. In terms of your, you've been involved in so many projects in the theater for so many years. How, and you must have had obviously your share of failures as well as tremendous successes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. How do you deal with those? How do you, uh, how do you keep going? Because uh, obviously you've kept going and, and then an, something else, some other success. Well, <clears throat> what's done is done. I, I never brood over failures. It seems to me another secret that you had was that you always had future projects lined up too. You were always looking ahead to future That's projects. Right. So that even when one, fi even as one finished, you were really looking ahead to something else. Well, I don't look back. And so you keep looking, keep looking forward to, right. the, to, the, to the next That's project. Right, I do. And uh, what about uh, Rosalind Russell, speaking of people, did, was she in Wonderful Town? Or, yeah. and, Yes, wonderful town. And uh, but she was not really a, much of a was she a very good singer or did how did you deal with that? Uh, she could sing and she could uh, dance what we wanted of her. So you, who, she could leave the Congo. <laughs> right. Who do you remember? Who choreographed Wonderful Town? Do uh, Donald Sadler. Oh, really? Who yes. you've worked with a great deal since then? No, let me see. Did he do that? Sure. Well, it doesn't doesn't really it doesn't really matter. I can't think of this Donald or uh, I think uh, Jerome Robbins. Jerome Robbins, was in it. yes. And um, the Bob Fosse, did he work with you at one point? As Two, a, uh, several shows, yes. And uh, did you sort of help give him his start as a choreographer? Uh, yes. What were the show? What did he work with you on? I, uh, pajama game. What did he choreograph? That was it. it yes, was, and I had to. Then I got. Uh, I got the Robbins to come in and finish the job. Oh, really? He couldn't. He couldn't get the musical numbers done. He did the dances beautifully. Are you talking about Bob Fosse? Fosse. Now? He could finish the the dance numbers, but not the ones that were the not singing. Not the musical numbers. numbers. Not the uh, well, a uh, thing like uh, seven and a half cents. Robbins had to come and do that. Oh, really? Is this because he was able to really snap it along and and get the job well, done? Because he's an expert at that sort of thing. But he wanted to be known as a director. So instead of getting credit from Fosse, I let him put himself on as a co-director. Oh, really? Of course, he never came near the <laughs> <laughs> But that helped him to get a job as a director. By having that credit then yeah. as a director. And of course, he went on to do West Side Story and a whole series of other things. Yeah. Let's talk, because of both Damn Yankees and... Uh, the uh, pajama game, your work with Hal Prince, because uh, you're, you've meant so much to him in his career. He really started as an office boy with you, didn't he? Oh, well, he was, he was office boy is a wrong word. He was, you know, like he was a gopher, too. But uh, he came and worked in the office, and he was, he was not 
just running errands. He knew what was going on there. He had, he was asked opinions, and he was, and he had ideas. And I guess he really absorbed a lot of what was happening. And then, at a certain point, you asked him and Robert Griffith to uh, produce, didn't you? No, I didn't ask them. They, they came and asked, oh, really? told me they wanted to. Oh, really? And, and uh, wanted. To, I don't know whether they wanted to use my office, but I let them anyhow. And then, of course, they had a very successful collaboration as uh, as producers. And then, now, how did Fiorello come about? Because that was, of course, one of the That's things. That's another. I, there were two shows we did that I re uh, repulsed, didn't really? want to do. One of them was Pajama Game, and the other was Fiorello. Oh, really? And then they persuaded me. They even started working with somebody else, on, on, and then they were On Fiorello? Ready. Yeah. And it didn't turn out very well, so they got me to come in. But you actually ended up being a co-author yeah, of Yeah, I was a co-author and the director. Now, uh, Tom Bosley was the, the the star of that. How did you all find him? Auditions. Really? Mm -hmm. you, he just showed up in an audition? Mm -hmm. You didn't have anyone in mind before that? Because he turned out to be... But we knew he was right. With The minute you saw him? Yeah. Do you usually have that sense yes. when you see somebody of who's, who's yes. exactly right for something? The... Um, because, of course, that went on to be a huge... And that right. won the Pulitzer Prize, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Fiorello did. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the... Uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the Forum, which is a thing that you, you directed. Uh, and the, in that case, uh, I think you... That was one of the shows where Steve Sondheim really got... Mm -hmm. got was that maybe the first show that he wrote both the music and the lyrics, I think. I think so, but I'm not sure. Which he had always wanted. See, Hal and, and uh, Steve, Steve Sondheim are old friends. They know each other way back. So Hal always knew that he was a good musician as well as a lyric writer, and he gave him a chance as soon as he could. And, of course, the the uh, uh, I think that's a show now. Uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Oh, by the way, how was Zero Mostel? Uh, he was, to, he's a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> to work with. Cause he, he, was the, a, he was a most unruly man. He's a genius, but he didn't care about the other actors one bit. He carry on antics when they had their lines. There was a scene in which he, as a slave, was supposed to watch these girls trying out. He, I, I tried to get him. I said, give them a chance, you know. See? So the next day, I'd come and look, and it'd be all right. Two days later, he was back in with all the comic. So he really was not... He was a very selfish actor. Yeah. How were you able to... Did you just have to keep sitting on him? Yeah. And uh, to get him... I told him once, he doesn't, said, you don't listen. He says, that's what my wife says. <laughs> <laughs> so what you just had to accept the sort of genius of the man along with this other, but it must have made it very difficult for the other actors. Uh, he lost a lot of friends. <laughs> yeah. I had heard that he was, uh, because I'd heard stories about him later in Fiddler on the Roof, which he had a large, of, yeah. which he uh, made, made it very difficult for other actors. He, 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 uh, he's uh, completely unscrupulous. Well, now most of the people you've worked, because the ones you talked about before, you talked about Ethel Merman and... Roz and Russell and a lot of these other people. I suppose most of your experiences have, with actors and actresses have been uh, happy experiences. Yes. And usually, if you tell an actor in front of the whole cast, don't do that there because I want to look over here, they obey. I mean, they cooperate. They know yes. that's a good idea. But it's not zero. <laughs> <laughs> what about the opening of that? Because I, I think you all added the opening... Uh, to, later on or something to, uh, uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum we, uh, the, the choreographer didn't finish his job so we got Jerry to come down as he often does and help it and he had a very good influence on Steve and got him to write this number A Comedy Tonight Yes, which and was that the, was really what put, set the show on fire was that opening number it set the tone for the whole rest of the show. Yeah. And it was there a huge difference? Uh, it, I mean, you could tell right away that... Well, yeah, it, just, it just made the play, 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 play better. And, of course, it's been, it's been sort of a part of the history yes. of that ever since. Mm -hmm. You yourself were, speaking about Jerry Robbins uh, go, coming in, you yourself were called in a lot, uh, particularly early in your career, weren't you, to 
help out plays well, as a writer uh, and a director? In, uh, in a f funny thing, I was in a sense. They were having. They, they hadn't gotten started yet, but they were in trouble. And Hal said, "Would you take it over?" And I said, "Well, the the boys won't want me. I'll cut." He said, "They'll love it." Oh, really? So I took it to the country, Merriwold, yes. and, uh, and came back the next week and said, "Now I don't think they'll like these cuts." And he said, "They'll love them," and they did. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. They so they accepted them. Yeah. Well, now in Fiorello, you were brought. You said you were brought into that sort of late. But you well, had, I was brought in. I rewrote that. You, I, did you completely rewrite? Yes. It? <clears throat> in terms of, I mean, did you? Was it just totally different when you had gotten hold of it than, uh, than when you? I you, don't recall. But, but you I, made some drastic. I did a change. complete job on it. In terms of now, by that time, because you've been cr given credit, uh, I think deservedly so, for really making tremendous changes in the musical theater through the years, going back to the point where. Songs were integrated with the plot in On Your Toes and things, shows of that sort. Uh, the transitions in the mu the musical theater has really changed a lot, hasn't it? Uh, it has. In and terms, it's changing now. Uh, what? How do you feel about what's happening now in the musical? I, uh, I think it's natural. You can't keep doing the same old thing. Where do you think it might go? I mean, it, because I suppose when we we should say when we talk about it now, we mean these big big spectacular British musicals. Spectacular and the. The uh, use of singing to a greater extent. All the way through the yes. show. Yes, making an opera in a sense. Don't you think we've lost something, though, I mean, in terms I of... I don't know. My next show is an opera. Is it? Is your, ne your next one is an opera. So, <laughs> well, now, in that case, did you write the book, the, the story all the way through? Yes. And then the lyricist and the composer? Well, just as an opera has areas, right. so do we. Right. And there'll be a place where... You can tell that they're singing a song, not just. But it's hard to tell because the the, the singers, the, the prose of the story is sometimes a little bit lyrical. You know, one of the things I think people miss, though, that that you were very much a part of, and that I guess because of economics, we used to have shows like "Look, Ma, I'm Dancing." and high button shoes and I mean shows like high button shoes for example that were really had so much uh, life to them uh, and we don't I guess because of expense have too many of those kinds of shows even things like how now Dow Jones and shows of that sort that you worked on uh, well, high button shoes you're talking about right? yeah when I got to the I, I was going through a divorce or something, so I kind of grabbed that without oh, really? paying much attention. But I discovered there wasn't any book. <laughs> <laughs> With high-button shoes? Yeah. So, every, was the, what was the name of the comic? Silver. Uh, Phil Silver? Phil Silvers uh, would break up things from old acts that they'd done. And you all would we, we incorporate them into the show. <laughs> but now, but don't you think, I mean, haven't we lost something by not being able to have those sort of things that were just pure fun that we had in, in, at that time? Which it seems now that the stakes are so high that it's hard to have musicals like that. Well, whatever makes an audience happy. Right. But then when some of these are revol or revived, I should say, some of them seem to work very well and shows... Uh, there, there are certain ones, as you say, like funny, uh, like uh, Damn Yankees, Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Some of these are revived and are still extreme. Funny Thing hasn't been such so good. One reason is they don't know how to play it. Meaning what? Meaning they try to mug it and, be, and make it into a low burlesque show, and it's just better than that. You, the, in other words, do you think a lot of people make this mistake in doing both musicals and comedy? I, my farces that I see revived shock me. Really? Yeah. It, it, b because of that? Because the actors try to be funny. Instead of create, Shakespeare said, hold the mirror up to nature. Be like character or be real. And that applies just as much to a farce or a melodrama exactly. as it does to a, a more serious, consider a play. That's it even it applies to a stand-up comic in a sense. Well, now, you must then be kind of horrified when you do go to see things that uh, you wrote or directed. Well, I get it. I don't like it. 
<laughs> and I remember you said that you saw a revival uh, of one of your shows uh, that came back, and they'd written in the audience, they, they were accusing the people of, of these old jokes, and they were jokes that had been added really by someone else. Oh, that was uh, um, Boys from Syracuse. Boys from Syracuse. Oh, it was full of stuff out of the joke book. And, but those weren't your jokes. No. Did you make them take some of the... Some I told them to, and they didn't do it, but then when I <coughs> went to revive it up in that uh, Cleveland... The play, yes, at the Cleveland show, Festival, yes. I took the script and fixed it the way it was, and I think Rogers and Hammerstein will respect that. Sure, absolutely. Out of that office, yes. Yeah. Being done like that. Tell me, you worked with... Uh, I guess you worked with Liza Minnelli on... Uh, was it what Flora and the Red Menace? Was that one? Was, yeah, that's was she right. was she in that show? Yes. And that must have been was that her first Broadway? That was her first chance as an actress. And tell me this: doesn't uh, you you've given so many people an opportunity, uh, and we mentioned Hal Prince. Do, I think he asks you to look at practically everything he does. Do, do, do you go to see? He them? doesn't really consult me. No, as a courtesy, he invites me to come and see. The things, but he, but he never asked for. Me. What did you? How did you feel about? Uh, uh, what were your thoughts about West Side Story, which is a, a, sh a show that that he produced and that Jerry Robbins directed? Uh, I had rejected that play. You had? Yeah. It seemed to me that the book was baby talk. It wasn't. I didn't. That wasn't the way gangsters talk to me, and I didn't know whether. Uh, that stylish music fitted the gangsters. Uh, the whole thing wasn't real from my point of view. But when they offered the boys the job, they came to me and said, we'd like you to be an advisor. And I said, no, you're on your own now. You do it. And they did. Well, of course, it was. It, it still has that. It's still a very sort of romanticized version, isn't yes, it? Of, of, uh, I, I didn't know it would be accepted the way it was. I loved it. You but did, I, when you yeah. saw it. Have you been fooled a lot by things that you thought maybe were going to be successes and weren't, and things that you thought weren't going to be successful and then turned out to be? Some. Uh, that was one. There was something else I can't think what. But, I mean, things where you, you thought maybe this wouldn't work. And well, it I did. turned them down, and then right. they turned out But now, me. what about things? Did you have things that you yourself directed that you thought maybe would work, but maybe not, but then turned out to be an enormous success? No. Well, I mean, you, I, the, uh, no, most I, of them you had a pretty good idea. Uh, well, we thought they were good, and we kept working on it, and felt it was going along well. Did, did you used to make changes when you would have a play or a musical that was trying out out of town, maybe in... Did you usually take a musical like Damn Yankees or Pajama Game to two cities out of town, or well, how far? How many tryouts did you have? I think we just went to... In those days, you go to New Haven right. and then to Boston. Right, so you go to two places yes. then. And would you make changes constantly during the tryout period? Probably. And then only... Where would you sort of lock it in? Just to, Well, you have to get let the actors get some confidence and let them know that it's not going to be changed the next day. So it's good for a week or so that they play the same show. So in other words, you would finally make a decision to set, to, to set the show yeah. at, a, at, a cer at a certain point there. You uh, set it, and then you come back and say, look, uh, there's one little thing. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, Once Upon a Mattress, did you direct that Once Upon a Mattress? Yes. Now what was that? What was that uh, well, uh, I've forgotten who came to me. I think it was the comp the producers were also the scene designers. And I think they asked me to get into it. And uh, Was that the Eck, Bill and Gene Eckert? Were they, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the Eckerts were the producers. And, uh, of course... Um, was Carol Burnett in that? Not until I was in it. Oh, really? Uh, I had seen her at the Dutch Street. Ever been to a Dutch Street Club? Yes, yes, yes. Well, she sang at one of those. Oh, really? I can remember that she sang uh, something about Dulles. About John Foster Dulles? Yeah, and, uh, it was a joke song. Yes. And I came back in my mind when we were trying to cast this woman. And so we would auditioned her and took her right away. Was that her first... Uh, yeah, she was a nightclub girl. 
basically. And of course, she went on then to to do so well. Yeah, but she didn't. She had, she just did nightclubs. Oh no, she did some television. Too. Did she? Yes. Yeah. But she was very good in Once Upon a Mattress, as I remember. Oh, she was indeed. And uh, the um, but a lot of these these people whom you used, did you find them in places like nightclubs or in? Where, where would well, you find we them? found them in auditions. Now, we, if they came from nightclubs, okay. We, we didn't. But basically, no, we didn't look at nightclubs. No. But you look. So basically, you found most of the people you found in these shows. In or did, you used a lot of new people in your yeah. in your. Well, production. sometimes I'd see a show and I'd see somebody play a bit, and I'd say we we've, we've got to have him, like Joe Ferrer. He was playing a bit. And, oh, really? Mm -hmm. This Jose Ferrer you're speaking yeah, of now? Yeah, yes. He was playing a bit part, so then you used him in a... He was playing a, an important part in a, my play about uh, Military Academy. I've forgotten the name of it. Not Brother Rat. Was that bro was yes. it Brother Rat? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, the um, in terms of a person like Joe Ferrer, or a person like Carol Burnett, a person like all the people you've worked with, uh, you say that 90% of them, or the, maybe even larger than that, you found have been very cooperative because they recognized that you were looking for the overall effect for the best for the total part of, uh, total part of the show. Well, I think the actors have confidence in me, yes. The, um, one of the things that I think that Hal Prince appreciates, uh, that so many people appreciate, is the fact that there's a certain point you don't try to hold on to people, as you say about West Side Story, you tell them you're out on your own now, you sort of push them out of the nest, as it were, and, mm -hmm. and let them go out on their own, which so many people have done who've, uh, who've worked on the, on the things you've, you've, you've worked with. Well, there's a reason for that, of course. After they become well-known, they have to par have a part. And if you haven't got the part for them, why... You, 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 why you've got to, got to yeah, go ahead and let them go. They're too big just to be put from show to show. I've had actors, character actors. There was one man, he, he's no longer with us, who uh, would play a show after show in some small part. Yes. George, on that note uh, of all that you've done for so many people... I'd like to personally thank you for all that you've done for so long to so many people, including <laughs> me, and thank you for being here today. This has been the Harold Clerman Seminar and Theater. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest has been Mr. George Abbott. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. The preceding program was made possible in part by a generous grant from the Educational Foundation of America.